On This Week in Enterprise Tech, some black hats get it wrong. The FCC does something very good and something very bad. And Periscope Data is here to tell you about the future of data science. Twyatt on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 237, recorded April 28, 2017. Tools for the Data Scientist. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Cloudflare, the operating system for the edge of the internet. More than 6 million websites, apps, APIs, and SaaS companies use Cloudflare services to load fast, stay secure, and weather whatever the internet throws at them. For a free online chat session with a Cloudflare support engineer, visit cloudflare.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, it's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I can't guide you by myself. For that, I'm going to need the help of my friends. Starting with Mr. Lou Maresca. He's a senior lead at Microsoft. Lou, how are you today? Hey, it's great to see you guys again. And we're finally having a, some good weather here in Seattle, so uh, hopes are high. Oh, and of course... The perfect hair. Now, also joining us is a uh, crew member from the other side of the country, Mr. Curtis Franklin from Light Reading. Curtis, hello. Well, Padre, things are, uh, well, feeling almost summery down here in the swamp. It's uh, fairly dry, pretty warm up in the uh, upper 80s. Uh, we could use some rain, but aside from that, it's a beautiful day here in the swamp. Well, we've got an action-packed show for the Twilight Riot. Not only are we going to be doing the news and the blips and the bites, but we're going to be bringing on a data scientist to tell us about the future of big data. But first, let's jump into the blips. Well, we all know this story, right? Your site is getting DDoSed into oblivion. Your customers are complaining and your employees are helpless to stop it. In the middle of your network meltdown, you get an email with an attached invoice from a quote-unquote DDoS testing service, a company that you've never heard of. The email doesn't state that you must pay to make the attack stop, but the language of the invoice makes it clear that $275 will get you a subscription to their DDoS protection system. This is a new wrinkle on the old DDoS blackmail scandal that is hitting companies in Germany. A group called the XMR Squad has been launching multiple attacks against companies that include Freenet, DHL, Hermes Snipes, and the State Bureau of Investigation in Lower Saxony. In each case, DDoS attacks starts the business owners get a invoice for the unrequested service, then the attacks increase in magnitude. Unfortunately for the XMR squad, they forgot to include a way for the businesses to pay the invoice in their ransom email. And they were public enough about their real identities that their ISP shut down their site. They even deleted their Twitter account after fellow black hats ridiculed them for launching such an ill-planned extortion attempt. That part could lead to chuckles from the Twyatt riot, but more soberingly, if... It's this easy to launch a DDoS, a DDoS attack, so easy that even script kiddies without the ability to think through things like payment can start and stop a scheme in only a few days. What else is waiting for us? So you probably thought you heard the last of record companies forcing the hands of the FCC, right? Probably not. Let's start off with a good question to ponder by. When and how is it appropriate to terminate internet subscribers and copyright when, when they have a copyright infringement? The latest lawsuit filed by Texas broadband provider Grande Communications. They claimed because Grande runs a service that transmits information and because some people transmit infringing copies of music recordings, Grande should have a legal responsibility to minimize the infringing capabilities of its service. This is like saying an electric company or utility needs to prevent people from using electricity when they actually commit crimes. One of the main purposes of the DMCA Section 512 is to make it clear that Internet service providers aren't required to be copyright police and that legal protection is the reason we have the multitude of Internet services we have today. The courts have generally rejected the perennial argument of music and film industries, but the suit against Grande shows that they haven't abandoned it yet. We shall see where this lawsuit goes and if wherever it goes, it could shape regulations going forward. 
Oracle is adding AI to its customer experience cloud. Oracle is busy building out the capabilities of its various cloud computing offerings, and it has now added a dose of artificial intelligence to its customer experience suite, rolling out adaptive intelligent apps on April 26 across the various components of its customer experience suite. Now, this includes the company's Oracle Marketing Cloud, Oracle Sales Cloud, Oracle CPQ Cloud, Oracle Commerce Cloud, Oracle Service Cloud, and Oracle Social Cloud. Now, in order to add data to its AI engine, the Adaptive Intelligent apps will draw insights from Oracle's Data Cloud, which hosts 5 billion, that's with a B, global consumer and business IDs and collects more than 7.5 trillion, with a T, data points each month. Oracle's version of AI is looking to add machine learning and a layer of automation to the customer experience suite that will allow businesses and CMOs to better measure and gauge what consumers are looking for while boosting sales. It can draw conclusions about customer behavior based on the data which is fed into the engine, and that can include factors as diverse as weather conditions, social media, and Internet of Things sensors. Almost 200,000 visitors will be pouring into South Wales on June 3rd for the UEFA Champions League's final. But for the IT geeks, the game isn't on the field, but in the big data being collected by the police, who will be using a new automated facial recognition, or ARF, system to compare every visitor's face against a database of half a million persons of interest in real time. The system, consisting of dozens of high-resolution network-connected cameras, will be installed into the main train station in Cardiff, as well as in and around Cardiff Principality Stadium. ARF has already been used several times in the UK, but this event is getting extra scrutiny for the sheer number of people who will be captured by the system, the fact that deployment seems to be arbitrary, the fact that there are very few legal safeguards about the saving of such gathered information, and the fact that this ARF is similar to a system evaluated by the U.S. Government Accountability Office, which found it misidentified people of color at a significantly higher rate. Still, as the drumbeat for network-attached big data semi-AI security intensifies, we should expect these ARF systems to be found everywhere. I feel like there should be an award show for this. It's actually a pretty good report. The 10th annual Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report was released this past Thursday. This report showcases breaches and incidents that have been identified by Verizon themselves and by 65 separate partner organizations. Does Verizon have to publish this report? Absolutely not, but they do, and it has some pretty interesting data surfacing in it um, over the last years. One is 1,935 confirmed breaches were from 84 different countries. The report also analyzes 42,000 plus incidents where attackers appear to have comp compromised the system, but there was no confirmed data loss or theft. 81% of hacking-related breaches employ either reused or stolen passwords or weak crackable ones. It also points out there has been an increase of set of attack vectors on small to medium-sized businesses with 61% of breaches happening at companies smaller than 1,000 employees. They also noted that the main focus of, of these breaches and these attacks were manufacturing companies who are more vulnerable to attacks. ICS or industrial control systems employ computer control industrial machines to, to run factories, which are also connected to networks. One would hope that more companies would spend time analyzing breaches and understanding the vulnerabilities in order to publish such a report. This would actually help the movement to plug in some of the security gaps as more and more devices and systems are connected to the networks. Hey, good news for a change. Bloomberg says network and security are easy. At the Open Networking User Group Spring 2017 Conference, Truman Boyes, head of networking for the Bloomberg Office of the CTO, had a message for IT executives. Networking is easy, Boyes said. We've overcomplicated the whole thing. He said that every networking protocol does one thing, advertising vectors. Security is just, quote, the inverse of networking, Boyes said. Now, security hides connection and communications. The complications come when you try to combine the two. Boyd's had harsh words for today's security infrastructure. Every firewall that exists today should be gone in five years, he said. SNMP must die, he said. On the other hand, multi-vendor support, simplicity, and automation are critical, according to Boyd's. Now, where does he see Bloomberg's network going? The two key directions are a seamless cloud in which it doesn't matter which cloud hosts a particular service and public internet access for last mile connectivity. We wish him good luck in keeping it simple.
After hinting at it for months, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai officially announced his intention to reverse the 2015 net neutrality rules. His plan has three parts. First, to reclassify ISPs as information services. Second, removing the power of the FCC to apply existing regulations to any new practices that ISPs may adopt. And third, open a debate on what to do with net neutrality principles like the prevention of blocking of apps and services. The new plan will be voted on in the May 18th meeting. And yes, we will have to talk about this in the bites. That does it for the blips. Next up, we're going to be jumping into the bites. And yes, we're going to have to bring up some FCC net neutrality goodness, as well as a little discussion on Google and those pesky little polls. But first, let's take a moment to thank a sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, this episode of Twite is brought to you by Cloudflare. Cloudflare is a company on a mission, and that mission is to build a better internet. Now, I know you hear that a lot as marketing speak, but Cloudflare means it. They don't just want to be another provider of service. They're dedicated to being a responsive, responsible network builder, keeping the internet safe by guarding the edge. Cloudflare has a global network of more than 100 data centers that caches your content and moves it closer to your visitors. They've automatically enabled the latest internet protocols like IPv6, HTTPS rewrites, and HTTP2 to keep you secure and give you more than a 30% service boost. They speed up every request to your site with performant DNS caching, content optimization, load balancing, and more. And even with all of that, you can be up and running in less than five minutes. Now, I, I know that they earned their rep by mitigating DDoS attacks. That's what they're famous for. But that's just the tip of the protection that Cloudflare offers. Their web application firewall, or WAF, is powered by a massive IP reputation feature. It analyzes the attacks being reported by all their customers. This doesn't just protect the clients but the rest of the internet. Now their security team is constantly watching for fresh zero days and deploying firewall rules to block exploit attempts before they get to you. They've got flat pricing for anyone. Plans range from free to $20 a month, $200 a month and custom plans for enterprise. And yeah, you didn't mishear me. They offer a free plan. It's part of their mission to help build a better internet. One where builders, makers, writers, everyone who has a good idea can reach a global audience quickly, safely, securely. No matter what plan you sign up for with Cloudflare, you're joining a massive neighborhood watch for the edge of the internet. Now, listen up. Cloudflare is offering Twit listeners a free online chat session with one of their top support engineers to answer any of your questions. Visit cloudflare.com slash twit to sign up today. That's cloudflare.com slash twit. And we thank Cloudflare for their support of this week in enterprise tech. We're going to be getting on to our guests in just a bit, but we do need to talk about something that I thought we had put away back in 2015. Obviously not. Yes, folks, it's net neutrality. It's big, it's back, and it's going to need your help. Now, here's what we know. We know that there will most likely be a vote on May 18th to set a policy reversal in the net neutrality regulations put in place less than two years ago. If it pass passes, which it will because it's Republican dominated at the moment, the SEC will seek public comment. Now you may remember when Wheeler came in, he also had a similar plan that would have allowed for the prioritization of traffic and fast lanes. He asked for public comment and it was by far the most commented on proposal in FCC history. Whereas most of their proposals maybe get a few dozen, maybe a few hundred comments, the original FCC net neutrality regulations received well over a million and a half. The new plan will include three provisions. It will one, reclassify ISPs as information services instead of public utilities. We'll talk a little bit more about that later just to give you a quick refresh on the history of that. Two, institute a new policy by which the FCC will need to convene and create a new rule for any new innovation that ISPs might create. And three, open a debate on net neutrality principles on tiering prioritization, blocking, and et cetera. Now, we know that Pi is making this move because he believes, he truly believes that the more heavily you regulate something, the less of it you're likely to get. That's a direct quote. In other words, he believes that the ISPs won't invest money in a regulated market. Now, he's been very vocal about this. In fact, two years ago, when the original policy passed, he said it was a political decision. He said it was gonna hurt business. That's not really how it's turned out though, Curtis. Tell me, this, this is a rallying cry we hear all the time, that regulation is going to kill investment, it's gonna kill innovation because these companies will not want to spend money deploying networks that they don't have the ability to extract full profit from. And yet, since the 2015 regulations were passed, 
ISPs have spent a record amount of money in investment, both in wireless broadband and in deploying their networks. I I don't understand how this continues as, as a, a logical fallacy. I mean, we can factually point to the amount of money that's been invested. And it, when the last two years, it was equal to the, the previous 10. How can they keep saying that regulations will kill investment? Well, I think philosophically, you, you have uh, people who believe uh, categorically that any regulation is a, quote, job killer. It, the, the, regardless of what the innovation or what the regulation is, any kind of government restriction on business activity will serve to restrict investment in that activity and restrict uh, the the ongoing activities uh, around that part of the business. Now, this is true whether we're talking about the um, environmental regulations, financial regulations of the banking industry, or in this case, communications regulations. So these people believe that no matter what the the level of investment we've seen in the past few years, it would have been far greater had the regulations or the threat of new regulations not been there. Now, I think as you pointed out, we have had record investment, and so that's a, that's a reality. The opponents of these regulations would point to the, another fact, and we've talked about this, that despite this record uh, investment, the U.S. still has some of the slower, generally available uh, broadband speeds in the developed world. I mean, compared especially to places like South Korea, uh, we're still essentially on dial-up speeds. So you you look at it from those those two balancing areas. Uh, I think what we're left hoping. Uh, is that we will get some sort of decent investment with prices that consumers can live with. One, uh, Pi believes that the market will force that to happen. A lot of people out there, including most of the commenters that we've had, disagree. Now, I don't want to make this a good guy, bad guy discussion because that's not where it belongs. Uh, I, I have actually followed the career of Ajit Pai. He's a very intelligent person. He has worked in the industry, so he knows how it works. And it's not as if he's taking huge payoffs to, to pass these policies. He is of the school and that they truly believe that regulations kill innovation. Regulations will kill competition. Regulations will keep companies from investing. So I, I get that. And any chance we can get to pull back from that brinksmanship of saying, well, you're just a bad person, the better. However, it's important for us to point out the logical fallacies. And Curtis, you 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 point out the first one that, that this whole idea of of regulations kill competition. Not always, sometimes, but not always. Lou, I, I want to get to you on another part of the bill. He and and the ISP industry both argued that the net neutrality regulations were just abuse in waiting. They were afraid that at some point, because ISPs had been reclassified as a public utility rather than an information service that the FCC could and, and they would regulate how much they could charge for services. And this this was the fear. This is what they told everyone. They said, look, the FCC is going to come in here. You're going to have a federal agency telling us how much we can charge for our service. And that's absolutely going to stifle the market. However, that never happened. In the in the history of the uh, net neutrality regulations, not only did it never happen, it was never even hinted at. In fact, Wheeler was the one who said, look, this is light touch. In other words, we have to do this because if they are an information service, we have absolutely no control over the ISPs. They can do anything they want. Reclassifying them as a utility allows us to hold the stick and say, look, if you don't play nice, we will beat you down, but we don't want to do that. And in fact, I would argue that the 18 months of net neutrality regulations that we've seen have done that quite well. What's your take? Do you think that regulations for net neutrality is just abuse and waiting? I mean, I think, I think you already pointed out, I think you said, you know, they, companies would have already exploited these things if they, if they, um, if they thought that was a hindrance on their, on their, on their bottom line, right? I think that they were, would have already started to do that. And most of these rules, like you said, are essentially trying to protect the little guy, the smaller ISPs out there and the smaller groups of companies that are trying to, to kind of make it in the market. Um, and so I think that that's where most of this comes from and also comes from smaller, medium-sized businesses trying to make it on the internet in general, you know, fast lane 
lanes and so on. Um, you know, classifying as an, uh, a utility comes with some of um, some good things as well when it comes to law and regulation. Um, and it also comes with some bad things. So I think um, so far, like you said, it, it ended up being some good things. Um, uh, some companies got, you know, different companies tried to attack some of the ISPs for particular things. Like for instance, the story I did around, you know, uh, the copyright protection, you know, trying to say that, you know, these uh, companies are responsible for the the content that's on their networks. I mean, it, essentially relating it to the the fact that a you know electric company would need to prevent people's electricity if they committed crimes. I mean, these types of things relate to ISPs and in their internet, and they just don't make sense when they're classified as utility. Now, when they're not, they're classified their own system. Um, you know, some of these things could come back and apply, and I think you know they're going to open a door to a whole new set of classification when it comes to lawsuits and regulation and having you know. Some companies try to force the hand um, of the FCC. So I think, you know, there should be some interesting things coming down the pipe once we see this 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 things go into effect. Yeah, in the chat room right now, we've got both JJ the four eight eight four and Emily the Strange pointing out that you know it's it may not have happened yet, but there is always that fear that anything government will eventually be overreaching, and I understand that, I get that. But here's the thing. If you remember, if you back up, let's talk about the history here of net neutrality. We tried for a decade to get the ISPs who were classified as information services. So in other words, they were what Pi wants them to be again. For 10 years, they turned down every attempt to play nice. You had the FCC stepping in saying, look, we don't want to do this, but we're going to have to do this if you don't do X. Comcast, if you don't open up your network. Telcos, if you don't actually do the things that you promised to do. And because they didn't, that's why they wielded the stick. I mean, it's it's as if people have forgotten that. It's not like we're gonna reg we're gonna deregulate and suddenly everything's gonna be sunshine and rainbows. These are the same ISPs who who blocked this movement for a decade. Now, we also have questions in the chat room of if this actually did affect companies once net neutrality was established. And absolutely, yes. I mean, you can look at the market and see the vast investment that we've had in both wireless and wired infrastructure. You can look at competition that's now taking place between Verizon and Comcast, where it did not exist previously. You can look at the markets and the way that they developed with the introduction of Google that have increased the amount of bandwidth that we get exponentially. So, I mean, my take is, yes, we do know what it does, and yes, it's a good thing. Could it be government overreach? Sure, into the future, but at this moment, it's the least of two evils. Curtis, I want to throw back this, uh, throw this back to you. When we think about the light touch, people think it's a hypothetical situation, but we've already seen the light touch. Most, people, most of us actually didn't, uh, didn't hear about this. We mentioned it on Twiat, but it wasn't a big news story. The light touch was actually used by Wheeler to keep both Comcast and AT&T from Matt White blocking competing telephony and content services. You may remember a while back, Comcast and quietly AT&T were considering blocking services on their network that competed with their telephone services. And we already know that Comcast and AT&T wanted to zero rate their own content versus content coming from other, uh, other companies, other vendors. The FCC was able to come, come in and again, use that light touch and say, look, we don't want to do it. But if you do this, we will stop it. We will regulate it and you will lose it. And then they stop their plans. So light light touch can work, right? I mean, you just have to have the person wielding the stick be someone that you actually trust. Oh, that's absolutely correct. And, you know, I think that what most of the ISPs and the, the carriers who might have a problem with the current regulatory regime fear is, is not the way the regulations have been employed so far, but the potential for, for what could happen in the future. I mean, it, it is very true. Once a government entity takes on a responsibility for regulating something, it's very difficult for that regulatory ability to be given up. And history shows that regulations will tend to proliferate rather than be minimized. So yeah, I can understand some of the arguments. That doesn't mean I agree with them, but I can understand some of the arguments that are being made about how the regulations as they currently stand uh, should be limited or changed. Uh, the problem is that, as you point out, we've seen that an absolutely unregulated regime is open to vast and very quickly moving abuse. 
And for many, many customers, the notion that there is true competition j just isn't true. Uh, there are still lots and lots of places across the U.S. where there is what amounts to a single incumbent broadband carrier, and the customers are left to deal with whatever they want to do. This is one of those things where I expect there to be lots and lots more comments during the comment period on this, and it's going to be fascinating to see how the FCC and their backers of both parties in Congress respond to what is almost certainly to be a, a virtual tsunami of comments. Right, right. Gentlemen, we're going to move on because we're going to be covering net neutrality a lot over the next few months, would be my guess. And also, I'd like to leave you with this. After the May 18th vote, they will most likely be opening up comments. If the same thing happens this time that happened the last time, maybe, maybe, maybe Pi might end up like a wheeler and uh, slowly converting to being a more consumer-friendly head of the FCC. Let's move on to another story. This one actually lauds the FCC. The FCC is doing something right. Chairman Pai is supporting something that I think most of the Twilight right can get behind. Now, we know that internet giant Google has been trying to roll out fiber for a while. They've recently cut back because it's just not cost effective. They realize they're never going to get the return on investment that they need to from Google Fiber. And yet, that effort has really sparked good things across the country. Now, Google is vowing to fight a search warrant that demands that the Adena police be able to collect information about any resident. Oh, sorry, I, I, I skipped that one. Uh, the Google Fi the current FCC rules allow for up to a five month waiting period before ISPs can install wires on utility poles. We've actually talked about the story on Twyet before. Uh, this, this has been a sticking point for any company that wanted to get into the broadband game. In other words, you'd have to go from pole to pole to pole and negotiate with every company that has a presence on that pole. In a city like San Francisco, going as far as five or six blocks could take you two or three years. We've actually heard that from the Sonic CEO, Mr. Dane. Now, what the FCC wants to do is they want to make a one-touch policy. So in other words, you negotiate once and it gives you access to all the polls and none of the incumbents can stop you on a poll by poll basis. This is something that we, uh, well, we've been looking for. In fact, this is a policy that the FCC passed under Wheeler's administration and it's very nice that we see Pi starting to to support it. Now, Curtis, I want to throw this over to, to you first. Are you surprised by this in any way, shape, or form? Because it doesn't sound like a policy that the uh, the Pi FCC would want to get behind. It's it's actually adding regulation. It is adding regulation, but but let's look at this from the pro business perspective, and and I think that's a, a good lens to look at at any of the the activities. One of the things that uh, businesses like are simplified regulatory regimes. Now, we've seen this in the way that uh, companies have not wanted to deal with, say, sales taxes across the country. They long were looking for a single sales tax set of regulations and a place where they could pay sales taxes for the entire nation on, uh, on the Internet transactions. And what this does is replace this this patchwork quilt of the way poll attachment is uh, legally structured and regulated and replaces it with one common practice and common regulatory scheme across the entire nation. That's a very pro-business point of view. And uh, I think from that standpoint, it makes complete sense. Now, uh, if you want to get into federalism, it's anti-federalist, but it is very, very pro-business. Right, and we've already heard Google, Sonic, any of the other uh, um, non-incumbents who have tried to come to the market explain how frustrating this can be. Because not only do you have to negotiate for every poll, but the incumbents can take as long as they want to be able to move their line. So, so this is how it would work. Let's say I'm creating a new ISP in Austin, and I want access to the polls for a particular neighborhood. I have to negotiate with every entity on every poll. So it's not just going to AT&T or going to Comcast, it's going to AT&T and Comcast for every poll that I want to get my lines onto. Now, once I get approval, and I will get approval probably within five or six months, they need to be able to move their lines. So they do what they call maintenance, where they can bring their trucks out and maybe move their lines up a little higher so I, I can have space on that poll. But there is no regulation on how long that can take. Now, I can complain after it's taken about six months. But as we saw with the deployment out east, when Google tried to do this, they were getting delayed up to 18 months 
for every poll they wanted to get access to. And this was the game that the incumbents were playing. They were taking the existing laws and they were just stretching them because there was no regulation on how long they could take, because there was no regulation on how difficult they could make it for someone who wanted to get on the polls. It essentially meant that they owned the polls, that they had a monopoly on the polls. And if they had a monopoly on the polls, it means there is no competition. Lou, the FCC is considering a five month timeline for processing everything. So that's from asking for access to the polls to the incumbents moving their line so I can get onto those polls. Is that reasonable? Do you think that would actually work for, for me to have a one stop thing to say, I wanna come into a city, I want access to all these polls and with five months, I can start sending out my trucks. I think that's actually reasonable. I think a lot of these companies, as long as they don't have to do it individually, um, they could do it as a batch or as a set. That makes a lot of sense because obviously it's going to take you time to lay down the cable and, and and put it on these poles, and it makes sense. You know, a lot of these companies, like for instance AT and T, um, you know, most of these regulations are restricted, can be restricted at the state level. So multiple states might not necessarily, you know, they could potentially change it. So doing it at the federal level makes more sense to kind of force these regulations down the pipe. Um, and so that you know, individual states don't don't have to change it or can't change it, um, and so it makes more sense there. In the same sense, like I said, many companies are 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 stretching out these rules. Like for instance, AT and T does this a lot. You know, um, you know, Kentucky, for instance, they they will come in and you know something like Google Fiber will try to come in and say, hey, we need to put it on the polls, and they'll say, well, you know, we we're allowed to take sixty days or more to even per poll to basically move these type of these types of wires. So. Um, and these types of lines. And so, you know, when, once you go and add everything up, you know, it could take years for Google Fiber to kind of come in there. Um, and by then, obviously, regulations will change and so will the local markets and so on. So I think that, you know, even Google Fiber and some of these the smaller companies are backed by a lot of these um, business altering, profit altering uh, issues. Um, and I think even if the regulations didn't change, these companies could come in and fight lawsuits based off of it. So it should be interesting how, how, how these kind of alter those markets. Right. Gentlemen, we're going to get back to this in a future episode, but I do not want to take any time away from our guest. We've been waiting for this for a while because we've we've had so many episodes on Twite about big data, about what to do with the data once you've collected, about this, this grand new network, this Internet of Things that will be bringing even more data points into our databases. The question is, what do you do with it? I mean, yes, we've got things like Hadoop. We've got big data engines that can make correlations. But what if you need a more nuanced view of what that data means? What you need is not a new database. You need a data scientist. And that's what we brought on to the show with Harry Glazer. He's a CEO of Periscope Data. Harry, thank you very much for coming on to This Week in Enterprise Tech. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Now, if, if you could explain to us really quickly, what is Periscope Data? Why did you create Periscope Data? Yeah, those are very, very different questions. Periscope Data is a platform for data scientists and data analysts. Um, it allows them to do their work sort of much faster and more powerfully than they did before. Um, and I'm happy to get into that, uh, you know, as much as would be helpful for your users. And um, I started it because I wanted to work with my co-founder, Tom, again. Uh, and that's a fun story, and I can get into that, too, as well, if you like. Uh, yes, please. So you, uh, I'm assuming that there was alcohol involved. You were drinking. You were saying, <laughs> hey, hey, you know what would be a great idea? I don't, I don't know why you would think that. That's so weird. It's uh, <laughs> highly unusual. Uh, just, uh, tell, me, tell me about the founding. Tell me about Tom. Yeah, so, so Tom is our CTO, and the thing that you have to understand about Tom is that he's uh, maybe one of the best engineers in the world. And I, I don't mean that lightly. I, that's not a joke. Uh, he's, he's certainly the best engineer uh, I've ever worked with. And so, in, and we just so happened to get matched up because he was my college roommate at the University of Rochester, uh, where I was a computer science student and uh, not the, anyone's best engineer that they'd ever met. And, um, you know, we, we were friends and I went off to Google after school and he went off to Microsoft and I worked at Google for a few years. Uh, and that was fun for a while until it wasn't. Um, and when I left Google, I was kind of reflecting that uh, I've spent all this time with these really senior Google engineers, many of them, you know, working on big data problems. And um, none of them were as good, you know, none of them were as skilled as, as Tom. And I figured, okay, my new career plan would be to work with him on anything. And if I could, you know, figure out a way to take roughly 50% of the credit for whatever he was doing, um, I'd have a pretty good career. And so I start emailing. I was actually flew to Southeast Asia with my girlfriend at the time, and we were relaxing sort of between jobs. And I start emailing him, and I said, you know, we should start a company. I'll start any company you want. What do you want to work on? Uh, it took some doing, but I did convince him to, uh, to join up. 
Uh, one day he leaves his job and he piles his life in a car and he drives down to San Francisco. And I met up with him. He rented the cheapest two bedroom apartment that he could find in San Francisco on Craigslist from Seattle, uh, which turns out to be the basement of a guy named Ray who lives in the Excelsior, if you know the neighborhoods. Um, and so I'm commuting down to the Excelsior and I met up with Tom and we just started working on all kinds of business ideas. And, uh, you know, they mostly didn't work out one after another. We kind of cycle through them. And we built Periscope as a side project. Um, we had a consumer app with maybe 50 or 100,000 users. We wanted to look at the data. We're both pretty sort of data forward, data literate folks. And we wanted something really sort of flexible and powerful. We didn't want kind of old school BI where you drag a column to the X axis and you drag another column to the Y axis. We wanted to do something pretty sophisticated. And uh, there was nothing on the market like that. So we built it over a weekend. Uh, and that was fun. You know, we were using it. It was great. And then uh, a friend saw it over my shoulder and he asked if he could install it too. And I said, you know, sure. And I sent him the source code, like, please feel free. But he couldn't get it to work. And he asked if we would support it. And I said, no, because we had a business to focus on. And he asked, well, how much could I pay you to, to support this? And I'm thinking, okay, we're nine to 10 months into this. You know, we don't have any money. I like money. Let's see, what can we do here? Um, and I said, all right, $20,000. And I expected him to kind of go away. Like, that's way too much money. And he said, sure. And he wrote us a check. And so that was kind of a clue. And I thought, like, okay, how many other people would pay $20,000 for this? And I asked a few friends, and we got another customer. So that was a clue. We ended up switching our focus. Um, we uh, hired a couple of engineers I had worked with at Google. At that point, we raised seed funding. And we rebuilt and relaunched the product. And we grew 500x the next three years. And my life changed overnight from trying to begging people to use products, begging people to buy products, um, to just trying to keep up with this growth. You know, how many support people am I going to need this month? How many salespeople? Oh, God, we have to rebuild the back end again. Uh, and stuff like that. And so that, you know, that kind of brings us up to date, but it all started because I figured, well, if I could work with Tom, you know, this would be pretty good, uh, pretty good career. If I could work with Tom, that sounds like a, a, a good name for a book. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day I'll write that book. Okay, Harry, now th this is interesting because Periscope is all about providing a better visualization for data scientists, a, a way for them to actually understand the incredible amounts of data that might be flowing through their network. I would imagine that this field has really changed over even the last five years. A data scientist used to be someone who would need to fight for data points. And now it seems to be more about rejecting data points that aren't as germane as others. Well, I think that's certainly part of it. But I also think the more data you can bring into the question, the better, right? So people are in this mode of rejecting data points, as you put it, because they're using tools that can't analyze sort of that volume of data. We're used to a world where you're kind of limited by compute and you're limited by memory. And you have to say, OK, which data points are important or I'm going to decide in advance to aggregate the data in a certain way uh, in order to get uh, you know, my work done in any reasonable amount of time. Uh, that's sort of no longer the world that we're in. And as of, you know, because of Moore's law, as of maybe the last five to 10 years, you can bring enormous amounts of compute and memory to bear you know, via AWS or your cloud platform of choice. Um, and analyze maybe up to a billion, 10 billion records and get an answer in seconds. Um, and as a result, I would say the question is really making sense of all the data points that you have versus really uh, rejecting data points or deciding in advance what data you're going to have access to. Right. I, I love how that's changed. And, okay, so that gives us the overview. That's the 10,000 foot view of what Periscope sure. does. What does it do for an individual company? So let, let's say yeah. I'm a potential yeah, yeah. client. What do I look like? What am I doing? What kind of business am I in? And how am I going to use Periscope? Yeah. So, so um, you know, maybe you have uh, 500, 1,000, 10,000 employees. Um, you employ probably a data team of data professionals. And that's data scientists, but it's also data analysts who are really our bread and butter. Uh, data engineers and other sort of data folks on this team. Maybe that team is 20 or 30 people at a scaled out company. Um, those folks, you know, they're doing data analysis every day. And their workflow maybe looks something like this. So... Uh, one day, the CMO notices that this conversion rate that's one of her KPIs, you know, signups on the website, something like that, is dropping. And that's really bad because she needs to get a certain number of leads to the sales team every month, and that's not happening with this conversion rate dropping. So she emails the head of the data team and says, can you please get, you know, get on top of this and figure out what's going on? And they will open up you know, a, a SQL IDE, SQL Workbench, or a terminal or something like that, and they'll start writing queries against their database full of all these billions of data points that we've been talking about. And 
you know, they'll run query after query, try to get a handle on it. And as they get a handle on it and figure out what's going on, they'll start downloading the results in CSV format, probably, uh, loading them up into Excel, making little graphs, and then, uh, and then emailing those graphs back to the CMO explaining what's going on. And I, I'm sure we've all gotten these emails, right? It looks like sentence, graph, sentence, graph, sentence, graph, kind of telling a story. And maybe the story is, well, you moved your ad spend from this network to this other network and this other network, you know, it's getting you lots of traffic, but maybe not lots of good leads. CMO goes, thank you so much. This is great. But then the CMO responds and goes, well, I really need to see this broken out, you know, daily instead of weekly. Back to the queries, change the word week to the word day in like six places, make sure it all works. Download the results, put it back into Excel, make new graphs, send a new email back to the CMO. Life is good again. Maybe you can move on to the next project. But then this, you know, the CMO replies again and says, well, I really, uh, I really want to see if my new marketing program, this third ad network, or maybe back to the first ad network, uh, is working. So can you send me that data again? I want to see the update. Cool, back to the queries, run all the queries again, download all the results again, email all the results again. And so you can see over time, these data teams become consumed by, uh, as a, to use the technical term, workflow crap, uh, instead of doing real science. Um, and so, you know, these data teams, maybe they're looking to speed up the workflow. They're Googling around, you know, how can I speed up my queries? They find our blog, they find our eBooks, uh, which kind of help them out. And they eventually decide to try the product. Uh, we offer a free trial, which is at the URL right down there. Um, and, uh, you know, they say they, they put the queries right into Periscope. They run the queries in Periscope. The queries run much faster in Periscope. They're able to instrument them, save them to dashboards, and share those graphs and those dashboards out to the CMO. Because of the instrumentation, the CMO can change data week or week to day, or iPhone to Android, or add network one to add network two. And the data scientist can do what she really wants to do, which is move on to the next science project and the next science project. So that's the very long answer for you of what we do. Well, Harry, that all makes sense to my audience, because we're used to being able to use cloud services to do the sort of calculation and the sort of correlation that maybe I don't want to do on my own cluster. I wouldn't. I don't want to sure. spend the capex to build myself the <laughs> system I would need to be able to dynamically allocate those resources. So that makes Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. However, our audience is also incredibly security conscious. In fact, we've uh -huh. got JJ to the four eight eight four in the chat room who's wondering, can I trust Periscope with my data? I mean, some <laughs> of the data that I'm dealing with, including HIPAA data and personally yep. identifying information, is very sensitive. And if it gets out, it destroys my company. Absolutely. What can Periscope do to, to, to put away my fears, to tell me that, no, we're going to protect your data, we're not going to sell to third parties, your data is your data, even though it runs through our service? Well, what I'm sure your viewer knows and what a lot of our customers know is there's not one answer to that question. Oh, we encrypt your data so everything's fine. There's a large number of things. Um, you know, encryption in, uh, for data in transit, encryption with data at rest. Uh, we can singly home your data away from other customers if that's of interest to you. And if you're in a healthcare industry, which is regulated by HIPAA, then that's probably of interest to you. And then, you know, for a young company like we are, we have spent an enormous amount of our time and energy on security for this reason. And so I'm proud to say we're SOC 2 compliant. We are HIPAA compliant for our healthcare customers. Um, and that's, you know, goes a little bit of the way to reassuring them that we can be trusted with the data. The other thing I would say is it's not necessary to move all of the granular data, each record into the cloud, if you don't want to. So if you have a database that's on premise, and you want to expose maybe an SSH tunnel or something for us to get into that on-premise situation and make a connection, um, we can absolutely do that for you. And that's also relatively common uh, for our customers in regulated industries. Uh, Harry, for those who are already doing big data analytics, there's going to be a question mm -hmm. here, which is how painful will it be to move to Periscope? There might be those who are fully invested in Hadoop. They've got or they've, they've built yeah. their own big data engine. And now yeah. they're thinking, OK, look, it's nice. I like what Periscope can offer. I like this idea of being able to give you my yeah. data, you give me the correlation, you give me the graphs, you give me the charts, I share them over Slack, I share them over however it is that I communicate in my company. That part sounds great, but they're gonna say, wait a minute, we just spent X <laughs> amount of money building yeah. out this capability. Where, where is, who is this for? Where's the pain point that makes me switch over to Periscope? Well, the Periscope is really two things. Uh, it's a visualization engine that solves a lot of the problems that I described and a workflow engine that solves a lot of the problems that I described. And it's a high performance cloud backend which runs queries really fast. Uh, if you have a high performance backend cloud or otherwise that runs queries really fast, but you want that Slack integration, you want to be able to instrument your queries so that the CMO can change you know, the graph from day to week or from iPhone to Android 
anything that accepts a JDBC connection is fair game for us. So if you want to just plug the visualization product into your cloud backend, be it SQL Server, Oracle, Azure, Vertica, we support a few, you know, a bunch of esoteric SQL backends now. Um, that is absolutely something that's up to you. Or alternatively, if you want the high performance backend, but you have a visualization engine that you really like, or you don't do a lot of visualization, you like to just look at raw outputs, uh, you can do that as well for Periscope. Okay, let's go to the other side. So we just talked about what happens to professionals who are already doing big data projects. What about those who are starting to do big data projects? Here's here's where I yeah. think Periscope can truly be magical because it is still semi-new compared to the rest of IT. Sure. And there are so many mistakes that you can make when you <laughs> choose. You, you can choose the wrong mm -hmm. engine. You can choose the wrong type of correlation. What mm -hmm. are the biggest mistakes that you've seen and how can you help those in the Twilight Riot who are looking at big data projects as they do deployments? I think the maybe the most painful um, mistake that I've seen, and, and Leon is a leader on our team, will probably have 10 more of these that he can share in chat that are better than mine. Um, but I, I will say the biggest one I've probably seen is people get in there, they they try to do something sort of self-service, maybe, maybe along the lines of Tableau or old school business intelligence. Um, you know, the, the marketing team or the finance team will start will start sort of dragging and dropping themselves, come to, you know, use the wrong data or come to the wrong conclusion. The company will select a direction based on the wrong data and, uh, and you know, discover six months later that the, the underlying hypothesis, the underlying axiom was wrong the whole time. And that leads to a lot of tears and a lot of pain. Uh, and so what I like about Periscope is that we have a, um, a mantra when we're developing the product is no magic. We don't do any calculations for you or extrapolations for you. We trust the professional. And so I would say if you're just getting started, you know, making your company data driven, I would hire a data analyst. I would hire a professional who knows how to do it. And I would let the professional sort of select their tools. And I, I would hope selfishly that they choose Periscope. But if they don't, they don't. Um, but regardless, I would let them build the infrastructure in a way that guarantees that the data is right and the data is flowing correctly. Um, if you're making critical dis business decisions, it is not a DIY project. Indeed. All right, I want to go ahead and have one last question before I bring my co-host in here. And that is, if if we had a member of the Twilight Riot who wanted to start playing with yeah. Periscope, how would he or she start? What kind of connectivity do they need? What kind of resources do they need? Where where could they just play with the data to see what kind of reporting they can get back? You need any data at all, even a fun, uh, you know, easy data set in a SQL database. And if you have that, you can go to periscopedata.com slash twit, uh, sign up for a free trial, get on your free trial today, uh, and play around with the product. And it's easy as that. Wow, that was uh, a lot less complicated than I was thinking. Mm. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> All right, Harry, let's go ahead and bring my co-host back in here because they've been bristling with questions aplenty. Lou, let me bring you in here because, of course, your company – uh, not your department, but your company does offer something in the way of web services, cloud-based services. You had a question about tie-ins, how this could integrate with the existing web infrastructure. Yeah, I think uh, two questions. So I think that being one of them is like, like I think he, he already covered it a little bit, but you we talked about how people have their own data sources and they potentially have their own uh, big analytics tools that they're running against. And, you know, what's kind of the advantage of moving it? For instance, if I had a data warehouse in AWS or in, mm -hmm. in Azure, you know, what what's the advantage over moving to Periscope? And you talked a little bit about caching and querying and that high speed um, and also visualization. And then the second part of the question is, what would you suggest for tools for different smaller businesses? Like for instance, different parts of their business, such as, you know, for just maybe the data consumption parts of their business, like for instance, you know, CTOs and, and mm. CEOs versus the kind of the data, data manipulation parts of the company. And then finally the data reactive portions of the company. So, you know, where does Periscope kind of come in though in that, in those different layers? Yeah, I would say I'll take the questions in reverse order. So as far as how Periscope plays in the broader ecosystem of tools at the company, um, generally the data team doing analysis, especially historical analysis, is kind of our bread and butter. And we'll we'll flirt with and help with the you know the data engineer integrate the data and the data scientists do modeling and prediction as well. Um, but that'll be kind of the handoff, right? And if you want to integrate it with a, a live system like the CTO might want to do, you'll probably use an API to get some of the data out of Periscope and into that live system. You won't put Periscope into your live system or, or introduce any kind of dependency there. 
Um, similarly, you can freeze out a report with Periscope to give to the CEO or the CMO if that's what you want to do, but you may also want to use the API to connect us to a more traditional business intelligence system, uh, something old school like um, MicroStrategy or Business Objects or something new school like Burst or Domo, um, you know, might all be good choices there. Uh, and then your, your first question was around, um, you know, let's say I have a SQL Server database hosted in Azure and I'm really happy with it and I like the performance. Uh, what I would say is you're probably still losing a lot of time to, uh, you know, rerunning queries over and over again, changing data week in iPhone to Android, as I mentioned, uh, answering the, you know, the same kind of question over and over. And so what you want to do is write one or two queries in a kind of an instrumented fashion, decide how they're going to be visualized, save that out and give that to the CMO and let the CMO kind of drill down, aggregate, pivot as she likes. Um, and you can plug Periscope right into that, you know, Azure database in order to accomplish that. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, let me go over to my other co-host because he's got a bit more experience than uh, than most of us living in the executive world. And Curtis, you've, you've actually got a question about how this is going to work when there's already an existing outlay on services like Oracle and other tools mm -hmm. that already have their own analytics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, I, I understand what you're doing and I see the value of it, but when I hear you talk about how people are using this, especially the, the ad hoc queries, this is sounding an awful lot like the same sort of conversation you get if you go to uh, you know, an SAP Sapphire. Oh, uh, that's that's what they're pushing with the whole, you know, HANA back end. So I, I guess my, my question is, if someone is already an ERP customer from SAP or Oracle or, or any of the big ERP vendors, is there a case to be made for them adding Periscope or are you really trying to hit the audience that doesn't already have uh, one of the big ERP commitments? Yeah, um, uh, I think it's probably both. Uh, we've seen two, two kinds of situations there. One kind of situation is I have SAP HANA, I have Oracle, you know, one of these Oracle products, and I find it very uh, clunky and inflexible. I find it very, um, you know, sort of uh, fixed in what it can do and not necessarily super modern, and I'm looking to replace it. And obviously that's an easy conversation for us. Um, the other thing that we see that's a little bit funny is I have this Oracle warehouse or this ERP system from 10 years ago, and it's really good and I like it. But now I also have these new cloud data sources that are coming in from new business lines that we've launched. And those are, you know, those data, are, you know, maybe it's in Salesforce now, um, or maybe it's logs from a mobile app that we've launched recently. And since those things are fundamentally in the cloud, we are engaged in these manual processes of downloading that data you know, moving it around inside of our on-premise uh, deployment and then uploading it into this other situation, by which point the data is days or weeks out of date and it's inflexible to get at it. And so what you'll end up ha you doing is plugging new data sources into Periscope as well as, you know, legacy data sources like your Oracle warehouse and then joining across them in order to do analyses. So I'd say, if a first of all, if a customer is totally happy with what they have, they may not need to engage with us at all. But if they're, if they're happy with their system but want to add some newer, more modern data sources, that's something that we can help with. Harry, can we talk a little bit about the uh, the DIYer in this space? <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. Th there's a natural tendency for IT geeks to think, you know what, I can build this on my own. I, I, <laughs> I have access to open source tools that I can integrate into my current system so I don't have to change anything about my workflow. Yeah. Is... Is that really doable? I, I don't think I've heard of a DIY story yet that I've been really impressed with. I would say it's relatively common among sub five person companies. You know, very, very, very early startups or consultancy shops or you know, you know, sort of, sort of businesses of one, uh, and that's like totally fine. What happens as a real business is scaling up and scaling out is that you have to maintain and improve those systems. And we've done some, you know, replacements of some pretty nasty um, systems that were great when the company was five people two years ago. But now they're losing two, three engineers full time to maintain that system and extend it and keep it operating at a level of scale and sophistication it was never intended for. And at that point, you really want to be allocating all of your resources to your main business. And if you can buy a solution, buy a solution and put those two or three engineers on something they'd much rather be doing that will generate much more value for your company. I don't know that I've seen a successful DIY situation at any kind of even slightly less small business. Yeah, and unfortunately, I, I'm with you on that. I, I love DIY, and I have built 
little big data demonstrators, but I would I like only that. consider little them demonstrators. Yeah, little yeah. little big data demonstrators. And the whole idea is good. this is this is for me to show the promise of big data, but I don't even want to think about trying to maintain that thing over the course of a business's lifetime. That's yeah. that's why I'm big into portals. I'm big is, big into as a service services. Uh, this is a little bit off topic, but I do want to touch this because this this is actually important. Periscope does have this extra distinction, aside from the fact that it's doing wonderful things with big data, helping big data scientists to actually visualize their data. But you've also, you're one of the rare unicorns in the tech world that is more female than male. <laughs> I was wondering where you were going with this question. Um, yeah, uh, you know, um, Diversity isn't just gender diversity. There's a there's a lot of axes of diversity, and we are better at some of them than we are at others. Uh, I'm I'm proud to say that we are. You know, I, I don't know if it's exactly 60 percent, but last I checked, we were roughly 60 percent female, um, which I'm very proud of. Uh, there are other axes of diversity where we have more work to do. So uh, maybe what I'd really say here is we're always striving to do better, and I'm most proud of that. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I, I will mention by the way, our network is also more female than it is male. Go figure. Nice. Well done. Yeah, it's wonderful. Harry, I want to thank you so very much for being on this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's always nice to hear a refreshing view on big data. Uh, could you please take a moment to tell the audience where they can find you, where they can find Periscope, where they can find more information about what your visualization services can do for them? Absolutely. Periscopedata.com is where we are and periscopedata.com slash twit. Uh, is where you can get a free trial if you've been watching uh, this podcast. Uh, we are on Twitter at, at Periscope Data, and I'm on Twitter at, at Harry Glazer um, if you want to follow me. Harry Glazer, he is the CEO of Periscope. We want to thank you for being on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Listen, I, I do this for the guests who are exceptional. Would you be willing <laughs> to come back in a few months when I get back from the thing I have to do for the thing, the super secret mission thing? When When I'm back, would you be willing to come back and be on a panel about big data? Because I'd love to get you alongside some of the other giants that have been on the show. Absolutely. I would love to once you are back from your super secret mission. <laughs> Which will be on Twitter. Go figure. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Again, Harry Glazer, the CEO of Periscope. We thank you for being part of the Twilight Riot. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here. We also need to uh, thank everybody else because, folks, you've done it again. You've used up another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of 10 Hadoop databases. And yes, I know there's a drinking game in the chat room. So everyone take a drink. Uh, we want to thank my co-hosts because I couldn't do the show without them. Starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin from Light Reading. Curtis, always a pleasure to work with you. Always a pleasure to hear your insights. Could you tell the Twilight Right where they can find you, where they can find your reading uh, over the next week or so? Padre, it's always a pleasure to be here. For me, look for my stuff over at lightreading.com. I've got uh, two or three pieces actually in uh, in process right now. Some A uh, couple of good interviews and a piece on, well, it's a vulnerability that existed in some old versions of server software and it's coming back to bite folks. And uh, it's a good, recommend, a, a good piece on... Uh, just how long some server OS software sticks around. You can also find me on Enterprise Cloud News and find out news about what I'm doing. Follow me on Twitter, KG4GWA. Curtis, always a pleasure. Thanks again for being part of the show. Of course, we also need to thank Mr. Lou Maresca. He is the man, the myth, the Microsoft mole. He gives us all that secret information that, uh, oh wait, I'm, I wasn't supposed to say that. I'm sorry, That's uh, you're going to have to scrub that in, in editing. Lou, where can people find you and your work? Well, you can always find me on Twitter at LouMM. And of course, my daily work, my daily job here at Microsoft can be found at uh, crm.dynamics.com. And, and check out uh, some of the work that's coming out here at Microsoft Build and Microsoft Inspire and some of the other tech conferences that are coming out pretty soon around Dynamics 365. My team's got some cool stuff out there. So check it out. Lou, Curtis, again, thank you. Always a pleasure. Also, thanks to you. To the people who come back each and every single week to listen to, to watch This Week in Enterprise Tech. We wouldn't have a show without you good folks wanting your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easier for you to get the show by going to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet. That's T-W-I-E-T. There you will find 
all of our episodes available for download as well as, and this is important, a little drop down menu where you can subscribe. If you want to know how you can support This Week in Enterprise Tech so that we can continue to bring you enterprise goodness, just subscribe so you can get the version of your choice, audio, video, or high-definition video, into the device of choice. Again, that's twit.tv slash twiet, and don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends all about us. Also, thanks to everyone who makes this show possible, to Lisa and Leo who let us continue to do this week in enterprise tech to the engineering crew, Kara and Alex. And of course, to Chibert. Chibert is our producer. He's not just a host, he's the man who is responsible for getting all these wonderful guests on this week in enterprise tech. So if you want to thank him, drop by his Twitter address at twitter.com slash A D V N E T L A B, Advanced Network Laboratory. And uh, yeah, that's a great place to talk to him. Finally, we get to the part of the show that I'm normally in studio to do, but it's very important. And that's when we offer Kevin, our technical director, some redemption. Kevin, can you tell the folks what it is that you do here at Twit? Uh, I don't know. I'm backflipping all over the studio since you're not here to get in the way. <laughs> okay, well, Kevin, you know that this was coming. We always ask you a question about information that you heard on the episode. And uh, this time we need to, to, we need to know. <clears throat> what episode are we currently running? 236. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Kevin. We are 237. Thanks again for oh, playing. But I skipped a week. I wasn't here last week. That's maybe why. we'll That's get why. you next time. Oh. <laughs> Until then, I'm Father Robert Ballisere, the digital Jesuit. Just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs>